This is Steve Zelser with Workweek, and we've covered the history of South Africa, some of the labor struggles in South Africa, as well as Namibia. And this morning, we're going to be talking with David Hempson, who basically is a, is, was a union organizer, an activist in the struggle against apartheid in South Africa, in Durban, and also is quite familiar with the struggle in Namibia and the relationship of Namibia and the working class struggle there to South Africa. So welcome to Workweek, David. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> So, David, first of all, why don't you introduce yourself, uh, your history, um, and your uh, how you came to become a, a union organizer? <laughs> well, uh, a little of a history, not too much. Um, look, I was uh, born in a family which is uh, part of the white elite. Um, my father was an architect and uh, quantity surveyor, but he had some Christian outreach in the docks of Durban. And I used to end up at a place called the Emissions to Seamen, uh, which provided, as it was then, only for white seamen uh, and uh, some Chinese and Japanese. But, uh, you know, there was all of that. And that led to some discussion. <laughs> and top of that discussion, that led to my looking around and seeing the marvelous, marvelously strong uh, stevedoring workers who were bunched up uh, around uh, the missions to seamen uh, in, uh, in Durban and uh, housed in massive hostels. There were 8,000 in one hostel and about 2,500 in another. Those were the stevedores or the longshoremen. And I saw from quite a young age, I saw just how black workers were being oppressed, how they struggled and how their lives were counted for nothing in the uh, in the docks where where Durban is. And by the way, that was Durban in South Africa, the major port of South Africa and one of the largest ports in the Southern Hemisphere. You were growing up in apartheid, and these were the conditions of the uh, longshore workers or dockers in Durban. And how did you get involved in uh, beginning to work with them and to organize them? Well, that is my childhood memory. Uh, as I went to university, <clears throat> I became involved in uh, more radical student politics. And uh, at that time, we were organizing, this is in the uh, mid-60s and, and later 60s, uh, protests against the segregation of the university, the political repression of uh, lecturers who spoke out, and the, and the bannings. The bannings were a term used in South Africa. That was a uh, house arrest of uh, people who had ideas and they were banned. They were prohibited from writing, of uh, speaking out, of teaching, or any way involved in, in influencing people. Uh, as well as that, um, you know, I could see, apart from the politics, I could see the lives of ordinary black people uh, was something uh, to believe. So I started uh, projects uh, such as uh, a night school um, at the, in, in Durban because black youth were not allowed to be uh, trained in white areas. And yet they would have to sit the same exams and actually not have the same training. So we set up a night school and the political discussions resulted uh, from that. And then the student movement had a division it was a non-racial student movement, but it was totally dominated by white students. The black students went along with that for a period, mainly because the liberal white students, of, of which I was in then in the ranks, although I would have regarded myself as a radical, but not yet as a Marxist, uh, they, felt they were standing up, they were being banned, they were being uh, oppressed. And so there was a certain respect for the stand that uh, white students were taking. On the other hand, uh, Steve Biko, who was a medical student in Durban in a segregated uh, facility of the university, you know, raised many penetrating questions. And after discussions uh, on, on among black students, the student movement divided and the black students movement, uh, South African students organization arose with black consciousness. It took some time to happen but it meant that, uh, for me, it meant that um, the idea of, of intellectuals or students working together was not, going to, was not going to take place. And yet, and maybe it wasn't going to succeed anyway, because what had we done? We had raised ideas, we'd had protests, it all seemed futile. 
when I looked around me, I could see massive factories being erected. We had the docks. There was uh, industry that was being developed. There were black workers who are now becoming skilled workers in industry. And a, you know, one of those workers uh, approached me when I was at university, and he said, "Look, please get me another job. It's, I'm being, you know, I've got a, a terrible uh, position here. My wages are just uh, totally inadequate. Can't you get me another job?" And I said to him, "I'm not going to do that." What we're going to do is we're going to transform your condition. So we started a radical student action to raise uh, the salaries, this well, the wages of black workers. But more than that, I said, look, rather than you look for another job, you'll do that. But let's organize the workers throughout uh, Durban. Um, and as we were, were working and organizing workers, I had the idea of a wages commission. The idea was to put forward something which seemed academic, <laughs> which would go and make studies of uh, workers in various uh, sectors and then present evidence to a wage board that had a phony wage uh, regulation system. But I thought, well, we'll put a bit of muscle into this and to pamphlet workers before a wage investigation took place. And people say, oh, it's not going to happen. How did you know? How did you know about this? It's all going to be a waste of time. Wow. <laughs> when we got the pamphlets out, the strike started immediately, small strikes. But then when we had the Wages Commission uh, sat in Durban, they had a small office in which they you know, would hear submissions. Let's call them submissions, nice, tidy uh, written documents. We produced something like a thousand workers, longshoremen turned up. <laughs> you should have seen how nervous <laughs> the employers looked and the state officials. Uh, you know, they were pretty soon making calls for the police to come and to check everything. But really, I mean, the, 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 the workers were marvelously disciplined. There was no ill discipline, but there were lots of words spoken. <laughs> and uh, that started up the idea. It once uh, it caught on that, that you could do something. It wasn't going to be a revolution. But it would be something to start changing the conditions of black workers. And that then led on to uh, the unions in, 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 in Durban uh, and, and, and beyond. But before I go into that, Steve, shall I mention that I was then looking around throughout Southern Africa. We had a position where South Africa was becoming a stalwart of the West in, that sen in the sense you had the shipping routes going around South Africa. It was meant to be... Uh, close collaboration with the West. And I was part of that student movement, which looked towards the student movement in America, anti-war, prepared to fight and prepared to make a stand against, as a younger generation, against the sort of capitalist system. And when I looked around, you know, I heard about the movement that was starting in Namibia. And I and others then went to Namibia. We didn't know a single soul, <laughs> but we went to Namibia. We started at Vintuk. And then you could see these, uh, well, these, these barracks, you know, for in which the uh, workers were, were housed, the terrible conditions there. And of course, the police were everywhere. You couldn't just walk around and start talking. But here and there, we managed to get in touch. And then I went uh, across uh, to Walfus Bay, uh, which was the major port uh, of what was the, in Namibia, but no, then it was called Southwest Africa. It was totally a, a colony of South Africa. And I met up with young people who were later to become, you know, the uh, youth leaders in, in, in Swapo, marvelous uh, workers. Um, they turned up with suits and ties <laughs> because they wanted to present themselves as, as somebody, you know, somebody of quality. And we, I looked a little ashamed in my jeans and T-shirt. It was swelteringly hot. Um, but, uh, you know, we, one thing I, I learned uh, from there, that a general strike uh, a struggle for black liberation in, in Southern Africa was a worker struggle. There were workers who were actually operating the uh, industry of uh, Namibia, which was then shipping, I mean, fishing and, and, and shipping, but mainly the fishing, you know, everywhere in South Africa, people would be eating uh, tinned fish, you know, from Namibia. And those are the workers who are actually creating the base in, the, in that industry and in the mining industry. Uh, for the uh, ruling strata in, in Southern Africa. So I learned a tremendous amount. I took that back to Durban. We had urgent discussions because we see that a strike wave would also be possible in South Africa. Mm. 
And you say that you were friends with Steve Biko. Why don't you talk about his development and his role in your experience with him in Durban? Well, Steve was a revolutionary, but he was also a gentleman. I want to say that because sometimes we feel that it was just rough and tough and you just take it as it came. But uh, Steve was uh, very sensitive. He was raising um, all kinds of ideas. He was very influenced uh, by Paul Freire, by literacy training and development of developing ideas, of using ideas to be able to face up uh, to apartheid. Uh, but he was uh, an, an inspired soul. The gentleman part of it, uh, which is, uh, I, I should mention, because actually it showed what the quality of the man was. Uh, he, when I would be criticized by one black student, he would say, what the hell do we have these whiteys around here? And he wasn't being, it wasn't very nice. <laughs> I, I don't blame him, man, but there it was. And Steve said, leave him alone, take your seat. We're all talking uh, together. And then when uh, the, there was this polarization and, and no one would come to uh, speak to me when we were at a meeting, you know, it was, it was one of those things. Steve came along and sat next to me. <laughs> he had a point. Black students had to organize separately. They had to have their own ideas. That was his vision. The black population of South Africa had to organize itself. And that was absolutely essential for liberation. But at the same time, he didn't feel that there was any personal issue here at all and was always available to discuss. In fact, just before he was banned and, and removed from Durban by the police, uh, we were exchanging about the situation in the unions, which then had then developed, and the situation in rural areas. He was very interested in the rural uprising. And so we were, you know, we would, we would talk as, as, uh, as equals in that sense that he would actually give you the, the time of day. He would listen to ideas. He, would, he loved discussion. He loved understanding, you know, other points of view and reflecting on it. But in the end, it was a different, I could see that um, the, the, the black student movement, you know, was, was going to end up uh, beating itself up, uh, if, if I could put it tough, in a tough way, it wasn't going to make the progress. The black workers movement was going to spring out of the earth and, and change South Africa. Mm -hmm. And we're speaking with David Hempson, who is a uh, organizer and an internationalist, really, in fighting for the South African and Namibian working class. And David, what were the conditions trying to organize workers uh, in Durban, in South Africa, under the apartheid regime? It seems like it was uh, very difficult. How did how was that able to be done? <laughs> uh, Steve, uh, it wasn't easy. In a way, it was easy. You just had to work, you know, just talk to the guy who was in the street. And they would be a bit surprised that if you were a white skin that you were interested, but they would tell you what was going on. Uh, except they would be looking over their shoulder to see who else is listening. So, you know, we worked on the basis of uh, following up any strike or action by workers. For instance, the abattoir workers, that is the uh, slaughterhouse workers in Durban. They used to be based right in the center of, uh, of the industrial area. And I read a small article, maybe it was on page 32, and maybe it was half an inch long, but uh, the workers had been on strike then. And I knew where they, they were. So I and another comrade of the time went down there and there was a beer hall. Um, part of the apartheid system was there'd be total segregation. Black people were not allowed to drink liquor, but they were allowed to drink their quote unquote traditional liquor. That is opaque liquor. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of a tough, uh, tough uh, drink if you, if you want to take it. It's pretty intoxicating but uh, very, very nourishing. It's a kind of a grain in alcohol. <laughs> anyway, it, the workers would sit around there and they had, uh, um, well, it was uh, two gallon drums that they would drink from. I mean, it was, uh, that, was the, uh, that was the cup <laughs> or the bottle <laughs> and they would pass it around and you would take a sip, you would pass it on and, and sip. And uh, so we stood there talking to the workers. They said, hey, sit down, sit down. And find a stone to sit on or sit on the ground and uh, take your share. <laughs> so when it comes, <laughs> you, take a, you take a gulp of the stuff and uh, that's the, you, you're part of the conversation, except 
my Zulu was terrible. I had some Zulu because uh, I was I grew up uh, with uh, black workers. My father was employed black construction workers, and I had some some Zulu, but not not adequately for uh, a discussion about how to organize. Uh, and one of the younger workers had a you know he'd graduated from high school, so he was an educated worker working in the abattoir and in the, in, the, in the slaughterhouse. And he explained when we cut the skins. They fire us. When we cut our fingers and lose our finger, we don't even get medical attention. He said it about three times. I said, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. Then they, they asked one of the older workers, now you, you speak to this young white man here. I was young at that time. And you know what the worker said to me? Where have you been? <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> In other words, we've been waiting for someone like you or a whole generation like you. If you want to change South Africa, we're talking. We'll work together. And every week after that, we used to have a, a meeting uh, with the, those uh, slaughterhouse workers, dignified workers. They would clean themselves up. They would wear the best suits that they had. Although they didn't have suits, but they had a clean attire and so forth, dress up. And they would come up for the occasion. They saw this as something deadly serious, organizing themselves against the employer and actually to change South Africa and the world. And they brought friends from the docks and friends from the brick industry and friends from all around. So you could see that, wow, everything was opening up in the 1970s. And then if I could just go on a little further here, Steve, and then we had out of the blue, we didn't even expect it. We heard about something like this, but a wave of strike action, which I've never seen since. <laughs> so we were the right there at the right time. And I probably was the happiest person in South Africa at that time. <laughs> Imagine that, a whole generation of workers standing up, fighting and winning, because we were winning too. There was the police came with their submachine guns, all the apparatus that were flown in from around the country. They were going to put down these Zulu workers, these workers that have stood up. They were going to show them who was the boss. But when it came to shooting with uh, machine guns in the open streets where they were black and white together, they were killed a couple of whites too. The police stood back. It was illegal to strike under about six or seven pieces of legislation. But the workers went on strike. They danced and celebrated in the streets and the police did nothing but watch. <laughs> what could they do against a wall, against a tsunami of action? If they started shooting, they didn't know what would then happen. It might've turned into the most bloody uprising that South Africa had seen. But, well, maybe not, but they, oddly enough, I had expected the worst, but actually it didn't happen. The police stood down. Now, true, you could find cases here that they, they arrested workers where they, where they could and so forth. But when the workers were united, there was absolutely nothing that the whole state apparatus could do. Instead of that, the prime minister of the time, John Balthazar Forster, one of the most vicious racists that South Africa has ever known, he said, I've learned that black people have a soul. <laughs> Quoting Dubois, Quoting somebody, or maybe just came out of his head or his heart, he might have had some inclination of being a human being. He said, people here have a soul. And what did that say? It said nothing in a sense, and yet it said a lot. It meant that uh, people, black people who had been oppressed, who had been kept in semi-slave conditions, were rising up and nothing was going to stop them. The ruling strata had to adjust and start living with a new, new reality. So this struggle of the South African working class also involved organization of unions. Why don't you talk about the development of what led to COSATU and uh, how that affected workers in Durban, including the dock workers? Okay. Well, I'm going to move from Durban to a, a small place uh, called Peter Maritzburg. Uh, Peter Maritzburg is the uh, regional capital of uh, the province but it had some of the most militant workers around. They were astonishingly good. Um, 
I, we, we started organizing the uh, aluminum smelting workers in, uh, in, uh, in South Africa. At that time, it was called Alcan. It's now changed its name a few times with one monopoly moving on to another. But we uh, called a meeting and we uh, put forward the idea of organizing a metal union. This is one of the first unions to arise after the mass strikes. And one of the older workers, well, he was a huge man um, in, in width and as well as in height, uh, but the gentlest soul. He stood up and he said, for to dictatorship of the working class. <laughs> he had all his salary in his hand in, in his wage packet and he put it on the table, bang. He says, everybody do the same. We're on the move now, you see. And I said, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> We're not taking all the cash like this. You're gonna be paying week by week, month by month. It's called subscription. But he said, no, we start here with the base. This is the capital we're putting down, you know, to get this union going. Oh, it was unbelievable. The people were dancing with joy. That we had actually got something going now. Uh, and, and so in, that was the metal uh, union. Then one by one in, in every sector, we started growing. In the textile uh, industry, we had massive textile mills uh, in and around Durban, uh, producing, one of them was the largest blanket manufacturer in the world uh, and unspeakable conditions. The, uh, the women workers who were the spinners and some of them were weavers, uh, didn't even wear shoes. They wore cloth, which they wrapped around themselves. It was almost like uh, Russian workers, maybe even before the turn of the century, you know, I mean, talking about before the revolution, you know, um, the only time they would wear shoes was uh, on the last day of work before Christmas. And then they would put shoes on. And they didn't want to waste shoes walking every day. You'd just wear them out. You would keep your shoes for special occasions. That was the conditions of those workers. Marvelous woman workers. Uh, they came in and some of the men who were the weavers were a little reluctant. What is this union? Where's the constitution? We're not too sure. Are we all going to get banned? Are we all going to be lose our jobs? The women said, we are with you. We are organizing. And then they'd say to the men, are you with us? And the men would say, yes. <laughs> and so we formed the uh, textile uh, union and then the garment union and then a furniture union and then a transport and general union to be able to include the uh, uh, dark works. And then a chemical union. We had one of the biggest explosive factories in Durban, you know, just down, down the road. So we were dealing with large scale industry. Um, and that set Durban, I have to, I'm proud of it in a sense. We set the pace. Durban was meant to be the most backward place in South Africa. Uh, in the past, people used to shed tears about the lack of militancy of Durban. Oh, it was too bad. People were so conservative. They're all migrant workers, never a hope, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And Joburg, the Johannesburg, the industrial center of South Africa, there you would see things move. But I made many trips up to Johannesburg. People were timid as hell. There was, they were not sure where they could meet. We were not sure whether we could discuss the union and so forth. Um, and then the spirit of Durban, the spirit of that mass strike swept through the uh, country. We started making links with the metal union in with a start of the beginning of a metal union in, in, uh, in, in the interior. And then in Cape Town, Cape Town's always different, but anyway, they slipped in uh, as well too. And out of the many discussions there for unity, it took a while, but then uh, we, we got uh, unity, particularly between the miners' union. That's one sector we didn't have in Durban. Durban's not a, a mining area at all. Um, but uh, in the gold mines and the coal mines, we had the National Union of Mine Workers uh, springing up, uh, not quite in the same way. It didn't have quite the same tradition of worker control that we pushed. We pushed it very strongly. We wanted to have a very strong shop steward element. But they had a bit more of a top down, but it worked. Uh, they had the, uh, the uh, clerk, the clerical workers, the white collar workers helped to organize and that meant it grew very, very quickly. Anyway, that union had a somewhat more nationalistic outlook possibly. It was less militant for a while. We were very militant. We had strikes all the time. Uh, that was part of our, 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 our average day, you know, organizing and, and preparing for strike action and, and winning too. We, we, we got 
although we lost two, yeah, I could tell you some stories, but uh, often, often we got something. At least uh, we were not, we were not trashed. Uh, we held held together un, under pretty horrific conditions. So out of that, uh, from those unions that I've mentioned, plus the mine workers union, you know, we've then created something which was in the beginning it was called Fossatu with an F, the federation, and later it became the Congress, the uh, Kosatu of, of the present. That is the basis of the industrial militancy of South Africa. Hmm. Ramaphosa, who's now the president of South Africa, how was he involved with the formation of Kosatu and what was his role in Kosatu? Well, I mentioned the uh, mine workers. <clears throat> well, Ramaphosa was the uh, organizer. Well, he was actually a student, a legal student, a law student uh, in one of the universities and he came into the union. I, I forget whether he finished his degree or not. Well, it's not that's neither, neither here nor there now. <clears throat> but he then organized those, uh, you know, the, the mine workers. And there was a kind of a block of sort of nationalist, but rather, if I could use the word, less than militant unions. They tended to want to be, uh, what, if I could put it this way, um, non-racial, but, but not particularly non-racial. I mean, the non-racial part is important in this sense. It's not that uh, we thought that you could be able to win over the white workers, although there were some prospects of that if you were strong enough, but there were Indian and colored workers. Remember, it's not just only African workers in South Africa. At that time, there were lots, large, you know, there were tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of Indian uh, workers in, in factories. And in the Cape, it was more or less colored workers for, for some time, colored meaning, you know, people who have other origins than black Africans. Uh, many of them being former slaves, uh, people who are product of white and black marriages or, or liaisons and so forth. So an element which uh, was very strongly represented there. And the non-racial was important in that sense. We were standing for the unity of the working class, black, white, colored, Indian, whatever the racial origins of, of the workers, but working towards uh, you know, class, class unity. And I th that idea, you know, won completely with Kusantu, uh, and it's represented there. Now, if, if Ramaphosa was then the uh, maybe not so well paid <laughs> general secretary of the mine workers union. Uh, in exile, we helped organize some uh, workers' education for the for the mine workers union, um, but a lot of the energy we later found. Uh, from Cyril Ramaphosa was going into talks with the top mining magnates in South Africa. Uh, he would go for holidays with these guys, go on uh, fly fishing trips <laughs> and the like. And, uh, and lo and behold, uh, when South Africa eventually unbanned the ANC and the Communist Party, he was in the front ranks of the negotiators. And uh, lo and behold, in one or two years, he was a millionaire and then a multimillionaire. <laughs> uh, he wasn't, he didn't bother with staying as the general secretary of the mine workers union too long after that. He then became one of the, the richest, he's not the richest, he's one of the richest uh, people in South Africa and a director of a com mining company. In other words, an employer, uh, not a union leader. Uh, and that, that, that was the character of the ANC. In other words, this liberation movement you know, came to power through the struggle in South Africa because we tore the apartheid system to pieces. In the end, the South African ruling class had to turn to the ANC and saying, look, okay, something's gonna have to give. We'd rather talk peace with you and see if we can get around this, this problem of uh, uprising in the cities and even in the rural areas, in our factories where the strike after strike and we'll, we'll, we'll settle with you. So what started, remember in the beginning, I said it started, the movement in South Africa started as a workers' movement. It started in those military-like hostels in Walfus Bay, in Vintuk, and in Namibia. It then spread through the similar conditions in South Africa until we had mass strike movement in which workers wanted to define themselves as a class and stand up against apartheid. We knew that there was a strong national element in it because black workers were separately defined in law and in every way in society, and that had to be resisted all the way. But 
we thought that would come through a workers' movement, and it started that way. But then over the time, we could see with the concession that the uh, rulers made towards the ANC and the development of uh, a kind of more, uh, if, if I could say, different currents of uh, resistance you know, towards apartheid, which included some elements of black consciousness and other elements of that kind, the movement became redefined as a national liberation movement. And then that the people who advocated that are now the directors of companies, the top elite in South Africa. And the conditions of the working class have not changed substantially in the time after apartheid. We now have 12 million unemployed. We've got conditions in, in, the, in the factories which were appalling. Society is not moving forward. We have violence in our, in our cities. Uh, we've got crime black on black, or white on black, all kinds of breaking up of, or a fracturing of society. We wanted a social revolution to complete, to displace those who had property and were holding the workers in, in, in oppression. That has not changed. So we face the same inequalities, the same iniquities as we had under apartheid, and we're starting a job all over again. <clears throat> and we're speaking with David Hempson, who is a writer and uh, an organizer uh, about the struggle in South Africa and Namibia. And the role of the United States and Israel, uh, they had support the South African apartheid regime. Maybe you can talk about that because uh, most people in the United States were unaware that the United States was involved in supporting the apartheid regime and also that Israel was actually uh, helping get military equipment and nuclear information to South Africa. Yeah, well, you know, one of the greatest companies in South Africa is called Anglo-American, Anglo-American Corporation. Uh, in other words, the uh, English, you know, uh, uh, organized things. That's the first, the Anglo part of it, and the American follows thereafter. And that's basically how, uh, you know, South Africa has been kept in the Western camp, if you use that term. Um, and uh, the British have traditionally uh, organized the colonial system there. Uh, the British helped organize apartheid. I mean, it was, everyone blames Africana and boy, they did put their stamp on it. But it the basic elements of the cheap labor system of South Africa, those military hostels, military-like hostels in which single black workers were housed, and the past system, which meant that every worker, black worker had to have a document to prove they had a right to be anywhere in the country because they were foreigners in their own land. That was organized under the British Empire and then inherited into the state. And still a cleaning out process of the state is, is, is necessary in, 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 in my view. The chiefly system, traditional leaders were paid by the state and they were used as state employees. So people's very rural forms of government, as well as the urban government, you had every kind of state apparatus arrayed against you. So that was the British contribution to, to apartheid, to, to the system. Of course, they were the investors in the gold mines, in the coal mines. They were extracting the wealth of South Africa the Afrikaners wanted that wealth too, and there were struggles against the British, uh, which you know chronicled in, in history. And all of that, instead of it easing the burden on, on black people, it actually increased uh, the, the burden. The Americans came in, on, in in this way. It was always a little quieter because the British were to the forefront. But American investment in South Africa was quite spectacular as well. They would join in on the investment, not having their own companies directly in the mining industry, but in every other way. IBM, for instance, organized the pass system. You had to have documentation. How do you make a bureaucracy work under modern conditions? IBM did uh, all the uh, uh, back, that provided the techniques, the technology, you know, for that. And then there was also the spying, you know, on, on our movement. Uh, the ANC uh, organized African National Congress was the main body of resistance of, of national resistance in South Africa. And, uh, you know, now froze. Nelson underground is where about now. How did you know? So we, you know, in that way, America was deeply, you know, deeply involved. The 
ANC, before the uh, is taking power, they developed the Freedom Program, which calls for nationalization of the wealth, the mines, the industries, and seems like that was abandoned. And also, the a lot of the industries were nationalized, like the docks were nationalized, the transportation system were nationalized under apartheid. What changed and how was that privatized uh, under the ANC government? Just before the, the regime passed power over to the ANC, uh, there were some spectacular privatizations going on, particularly in tele, telecoms, telecommunications. Uh, and uh, the ANC didn't resist this because many of their people were becoming directors of these companies. It seemed a good thing. Uh, so that the cell phone companies, which are, you know, the really large uh, corporations in South Africa and spread throughout Africa, uh, were, uh, you know, the ANC people were, were involved in the privatized uh, corporations out of that. And the same happened with the steel industry. Hmm. I was saying many of the trade union officials and uh, COSATO and other unions were integrated into the capital structure. Uh, how did they, did they use privatization and giving them shares become stockholders, co-managers of uh, the, uh, the economy in South Africa? Yeah, the, the, there wasn't exactly a straight line uh, in, involved here. But what happened was that, you know, generally the, you know, a, a nationalist movement didn't want to pri privatize. They wanted, first of all, to get uh, black people in the key positions uh, rather than, uh, than privatize, which would have meant that white people, big companies would have taken over. So, you know, that's what, that was the priority, first of all, was to establish uh, black leadership and correctly so. I mean, there was a white state. I mean, you had to have black representation. Was, this is a complete, complete political revolution, you know, you know, took place. But when that happened, we had massive outsourcing. It wasn't called privatization and put on the stock exchange, but you had huge contracts going out for substantial parts of work in every single department, going from water affairs to railways and every other way, it wasn't the state doing the job. The state was contracting out the work to be done. And this meant that, well, we had this program called Black Economic Empowerment, BEE. Now, who could argue against Black Economic Empowerment? A great idea. The only way that Black empowerment was, was conducted, though, was not empowering black workers. It was empowering the black elite to form companies and then to be able to write contracts for those companies and to dish out money to these guys. So we had this attempt to build a black capitalist class. That was one strand of it, to build a black capitalist class by giving them contracts and giving them work, work to do. And that often meant that black people were fronting white companies because the white companies had the expertise, they had the engineers, they had the accountants and, and all the rest of it. So these guys then took maybe 50% of the money and, and then paid for the job to be done with the other 50%. Now that's gone on until it's an absolute disaster in South Africa. There's hardly a state department which is actually doing its job. They just contract out all the work to be done. And of course, it means that most of the time, the work is not done. You contract out, who's there to check on the contracts and so forth? No one, these are all secrets. Nobody knows what the contract was, except that this BEE group, this Black Empowerment Group is doing the job. Then you found out 3 million, I've just been reading about it, 3 billion rand, which is uh, a little less than dollars, and not a, not a billion dollars, was spent on one single water project. It wasn't a huge project. It was oversubscribed, let's say, by about 300 times. They are still trying to find out what happened because the people are saying they never got the water in the first place. So you have corruption on that scale. The other idea was you've got these white companies, white administered companies, let's bring black people into, the, into these companies. So that is another process which is uh, involved. So that Anglo-American now has a black director and most of the directors are black. In other words, it's the same company, although there have been big shifts taking place in where they're putting the money. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's the black people in, in, in involved. Now, does that help anybody? What South Africa has seen in, this, in the process after apartheid is that inequality is now greater than under apartheid. 
inequality is greater than under apartheid. I, it's, I, I can hardly say, put the words together. You cannot believe it. But what has happened is that a black elite has become consolidated with the white elite. It's the same thing now, really. And people are li you know, living together and all of that, going to the same schools, going to the same university, sending their kids over to America for education. You know, all of that, all of that's uh, going on. And at the base, we have 12 million unemployed. Now, what does that mean in terms of the income? Well, obviously it's a disaster. At least under apartheid, or at least under some conditions where uh, uh, capitalism had some life, people had a job. It was a measly, horrible job with, with next to nothing. But now joblessness haunts the land. And we've seen uprisings such as happened recently in, uh, in KwaZulu-Natal and, and in the Gauteng, the interior, where people have just taken to looting shops. People are really desperate. It's... it's taken hold in South Africa. It's of course not the way to, to go in, in so many ways. And now we, you know, South Africa is in a quandary because the economy is not, not growing. We're finding all the uh, issues which are unsolved from the previous period are now reappearing. And on top of it, we have a very high AIDS epidemic uh, coming on and then COVID coming on top of that. So, you know, often conditions are desperate. I'm just he getting, hearing reports now you know, of, of brothers losing sisters who've been murdered by their boyfriends. You know, it's, it's, in other words, we, our, our confidence in changing society has been ruined by a society in decay. And that's not, that's not the South Africa anybody fought for. And yet and, that's what capitalism has given us. Yeah. And Mandela, this idea that you could have the democratic revolution, democracy, and then have socialism, where has that gone? Well, what a lovely dream. <laughs> in other words, who wants a revolution which is going to have blood in the streets and all the rest of it? You could do it little by little in South Africa. It's an about anchi. I mean, a little tiny, little bit of it, not even an inch, uh, that you would work away at it. And then it would, you know, it would be a, a sliding scale. And then you'd move from 5% uh, to 10% to 50 to 50 to 80%. And you get your 100%. Who's to argue with that? A lot of people think it's a great idea. Any problem, it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. And people say, well, give you more time. Give you more time for more inequality, for more wealth to be accumulated in one pole and more misery in the other. What is time going to help with, with that kind of problem? They promised us structural reform. Listen to it, structure. Structural reforms. You would, you would change the dynamos. You would reorganize the system completely. That was what they promised. They being the experts that offered this, you know, two-stage revolution. And then once you've got the structural reforms in place, we'd move on to the rest. Deepening democracy, giving everybody a job, guaranteeing a better life. Well, well who, could, who could argue against that? It sounds brilliant, except it never happened. It went the, exactly the opposite way. And it's not an accident. The whole of Africa has happened this. And everywhere there's been a reformist movement of this kind, it's had the same reversal. And it's not just a little bit going against you. You have terrible conjunctures. Things blow up. And on the mining industry, we've seen workers massacred, black policemen shooting black miners and killing them. And that was Cyril Ramaphosa was involved in ordering the police to take decisive action against mine workers. Now that in South Africa was you know, we, we have heralded massacres under white rule, and now we have massacres under black rule. What is changing? In other words, society is not inching forward. It's not a continual development. In fact, in the it's moving in an opposite direction. And, and explosions happen because when things don't change, youth has to find its way. People have to have a say. And then you will find the South Africa, so that, you know, any society would go through the stresses that we're going through in, in South Africa. And they're terrible stresses. The situation of women is, is appalling. We, I've mentioned, you know, some of, you know, one case. We've got the best legislation on rights for women. I wouldn't say the best in the world, but it's not bad. But rights on paper mean nothing at all. When women are too scared even to get out of the house, 
When a child uh, with a cell phone walks out of a house, gets robbed, buys another cell phone, walks out of the house again, and is robbed again. Oh, dear. You know, we, our society, we're we, we scratching each other eyes out. This is a terrible downturn in, in society. And yet we have the promise through the working class, in the unions, in the youth movement, which is becoming resilient again, you know, to change society. We've got to grab it with both hands and move forward again. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it seems uh, almost, uh, you know, uh, amazing that, you know, the uh, Ramaphosa, who was a leader of the Mine Workers Union, is uh, basically brought into the capitalists is uh, in charge or a director of Longman, uh, the mining company, and is colluding with the shooting down of the miners, the massacre of the miners, and then becomes president uh, of the ANC, and then uh, president of the company or head of the ANC, and then president of South Africa, and his hands are dirty, basically, in the massacre of workers. And the, politically, the Communist Party in South Africa, South African Communist Party, has said that they're bringing socialism. How do people who call themselves socialists uh, justify being in a government that supports capitalism in South Africa? <laughs> yeah, no, these are, I think the term is contradictions. <laughs> we live in contradictions. And, you know, those who are singing uh, socialism, Tina Yabuya Nayo, socialism, we are coming to you. We are coming to you. That was the, that was the song that was sung during the resistance. Uh, no one sings that song now. It's, it's, we, we're struggling to get there, but you can't sing it with any of that confidence we, we had at that time, mainly because in between the struggle that we had in the 1970s, it seemed fairly straight line process, but with the restoration, uh, well, we've had democracy, which boy, we, we, we sure enjoy that, being able to speak and to be able to organize freely. But at the same time, what we've had in, 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 uh, in South Africa is the establishment of a, of a national bourgeois. It's a, it's a class in a sense, but it's not a capitalist class. It's, a, it's an elite and a blank elite, which has actually decided that it's going, it's after the money. Just about every single discussion in South Africa is about money. One of the comrades was telling me that he joined the Communist Party in Durban. He participated in it. And one of the uh, people who was present, as a young woman, asked, where do we get the contracts? Where do we get the contracts, the municipal contracts? In the Communist Party, I mean, the words fail me. Are you, where did that idea even come to ask that question? But that's what it says. Each organization in supporting the government, the Communist Party, the African National Congress too, is a way of dis dispensing favors. Well, not even favors, big favors, big, big dollar favors, you know. Uh, that's in other words, when you get to become a mayor of a town, You've got maybe a couple of billion, maybe you've got a billion dollars, you know, out, out there. And in the larger towns, that is, is at least that. And now you just you distribute it to your pals uh, through your various departments and all the rest of it, and you outsource all of the stuff. It's it's mindless. It, and, and it's mindless because we are seeing a complete impulse, uh, yet impasse in building houses. We've got water, which completely, you know, is breaking down all the time. Our electricity, you know, electricity supply is, is on and off all the time. In other words, all the public services are being degraded, you know, by this habit. All our state enterprises, which were the bastion of apartheid, those state enterprises provided everything that the apartheid state needed. Now they're in total disarray. They're all making losses uh, beyond imagination, unnecessary, uh, and so forth, poorly administered, being given... Uh, Key, key, key people are being given jobs in that uh, because of their position politically. So we, we, we've got a, a, a very messy situation. How did this happen? Well, there's a natural order in this sense in capitalism. If you're after the money, then you, you take the easiest route. <laughs> and the, it's an easy route for the, for the elites, you know, to take this route, to be able to take money, not to really give a, not to, you know, not to do the work, to outsource everything when you're in the state. It's, uh, it's disgusting and, and it's degrading to the whole of society, but it's taking place. Uh, now for a while, the workers have been bemused 
a little bit confused by this development because who would imagine the father would turn against the son? These are the fathers that are in power now. And now they are turning and the son asks for bread and they're giving him a stone to use the biblical analogy. So you see, this is what's, what's coming about. It takes a while for people to, to understand this, but the unions are linked to the communist party. The communist party sees that the ANC is going to be the ruler and they want to keep it uh, that way. And so the unions fall in, in, in line with that. And they don't even fight for their little more of their share. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very sad situation, but it will all change. I was listening a while ago to someone who was talking about the uh, slave system and which slaves would believe that the anti-slavery movement would ever succeed, even if they knew there was such a thing as an anti-slavery movement. On one day, did they ever believe that they would ever be free? And yet it did happen. And it happened because of international organization as never before, except with the anti-apartheid movement. International solidarity, which moved from one continent to the other, involving people from universities, from factories, from every workplace, every person who had some political awareness would be involved in that solidarity. And that's what we have to establish, not just for South Africa, but internationally, to change the system under which we are living. And we're talking with David Hempson now. David, you also were involved in the struggle in Namibia, which, as we know, was a contract labor situation for the workers. And in South Africa today, in Durban, for example, Transnet, which was a nationalized company, is being outsourced. They're trying to privatize the docks of Durban. Uh, what are the conditions of contract labor now in South Africa? In the mines, for example, platinum miners are under contract labor. Has there been a reversion back to the conditions under apartheid? actually. Yeah, it's, but there's a difference uh, in this way, Steve. Let's just, let me give you two pictures, which, and then compare the two. Uh, under apartheid, you had these military-like barracks. The workers were held in the harbor, and there were about eight to, eight to 10,000 workers right in the harbor in, in, in Durban, being held under semi-military conditions. They weren't allowed out. There were, there were guards at the uh, gate and, and, and everything else. No women were allowed, it was men only. It was, it, it was a military camp. And the workers then were employed on 11 to 12 month contracts. They were not allowed a full 12 months uh, beyond because that would give them entitlement to live in the urban area. You had to be semi-slave labor conditions so that you didn't get the permanence to be able to demand a living wage for your family, for your kids to get an education and to be able to develop as, as, as a human being in an urban society. So that is picture number one. Picture number two, when I come back from exile, that compound is being bashed down, it's being demolished. It's being turned into luxury apartments for the elite to live and to look over the sea and over the harbor. Those workers who could have had their kids in the local schools and could have actually had a life in the urban areas have nothing. They have, to fight, they have to fight to be able to get a house if they can in the urban area or maybe just maintain the rural base. It, and on top of it, the work has been completely casualized. You don't get 11 months contract. You get a day's contract. Every day you look for a contract and you hope that you've got your own luck. I struggled to develop with others a national dock labor scheme, which at least would provide a guaranteed three or four days work, hopefully five days work in, in, in a week, and that there would be a retention fee that you'd have to pay a worker when, when there was no work available. And that was all possible, entirely possible. And in the beginning, the ANC, and when it came to power, entertained that idea, except that every day, Every, sorry, not every day, but every time we met uh, with the state, it was a different department. It was a labor department, then it was a transport department, and then it was a state enterprises department. And, you know, they're passing the ball from one to the other, uh, trying to not score a goal, you know? And it just went on and on until there was no one to talk to. And then we just had to sit there and, and fight. We actually did win some concessions, but then in the end, it was all broken up again. Today, the workers are sleeping on the streets. They are 
crowding around uh, uh, begging for, for work. That is the way in which contract labor, now you have contractors, they will get those guys on the street and say, okay, I will get, I'm going to bid for 40 jobs as stevedores. Uh, get yourselves together, I will bid for you. And that's the way it goes. So in other words, you're not even an, a worker now. You're not a worker. You're an employee, you're, you're a contractor. You're a contractor for $5 a day. <laughs> that's, it. that's the contract. And that's the way in which everything that we fought for has been diminished. It's all fair and square. This is uh, liberty, you've got democracy, you've got the rights, all the human rights you, you, you want. But the contract and contracts rule, if you go to court, it's a contract. You contracted to that guy and that guy contracted to another guy to be able to offer your labor. The only irony of this is if somebody crashes a truck, well, who's to blame? It's not that worker, he was not a worker, was he? <laughs> he was a contractor, but unfortunately it shows in your driver's license, that's all. So the shape up and the, the unions are in a vulnerable position because of this contract labor that exists now in, in South Africa. Now compare this to what's going on now in Namibia where workers as, as well in the mines, uh, the Rossing mine are being f becoming contract laborers as well by investors, uh, Chinese and other investors in Namibia. Why don't you talk about a comparison between South Africa and, and the fight against uh, contract labor in Namibia and its relationship to South Africa? Well, it's too amazing, Steve. I couldn't uh, believe it. Uh, but the uh, Chinese uranium company has bought out a uh, rossing mine, which you know, people had heard of in the past because we heard of the struggles of the rossing miners, and they they made its considerable achievements in, in the mine union. But well, with, what, with, was the, what was the history of the rossing mine in uh, Namibia, the freedom of Namibia? Well, it was a critically important uh, mine in terms of Western uh, uranium policy, you see, and, and, and the development of... Uh, you know, a nuclear power internationally. I think it was particularly good quality uh, uranium. And for that, it, 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 it had a high stock. Now, I didn't know much about the struggle of the workers. They were involved in, the, in 1971, 72, when I was there, although it was impossible to go there because they had security all around the place. Um, you know, you just wouldn't get near. Uh, but, you know, they, they eventually, I mean, come, come independence and, and, and uh, change there. They have organized themselves. But with the coming in of the uh, Chinese uh, nuclear corporation, I, I can't believe what's happened. Every, that whole union agreement has been completely uh, thrown out of the window. The key workers have, have been fired. And they put Chinese contractors, contractors meaning it's somebody standing there. If you want a job, come to me. I'll give you a job for a day, maybe two days if you're lucky. You had a previously, you had a full-time job. Now you're reduced to this pittance. And you now have to turn up and do everything as said and uh, you know, buy this contractor. And that contractor is not even a person who's an, in, uh, a citizen of that country. I, you know, it's, it's mind boggling. Now we're looking in South Africa, we haven't quite got to that extent, but South African workers don't even know this is happening. I mean, I've learned about this by reading a little about what, what's happening. And we have to pass on the news to South Africa. This is what's gonna happen if you do not organize and we change society completely and actually reorganize the economic base. All the labor rights and paper, you know, don't count for, for anything unless you actually change the base of society. We're not going to be able to have a decent living, you know, under the present conditions, and we could even see it get worse. Mm. And China has argued with its investment, Silk Road and the BRICS, that it is helping develop Africa, Asia, Latin America by investing in infrastructure um, and helping out the people of these countries develop the infrastructure. What's your thoughts on that? Well, just remember what colonialism did in, in Africa. <laughs> I mean, Africa was a continent which had a certain unity in, in, a, in a sense. There was, you know, there were no things as borders. There were no separate languages. People intermarried. There was, you know, they, 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 I wouldn't say it was perfect, perfection, but there were, there were kingdoms. There were, there was development. You know, it's hard to believe it now, but uh, the British were impressed 
when they arrived in the area which they now call Nigeria by the wealth of the people. <laughs> and now those people have been degraded, you know, through colonialism and through unequal exchange and, and all the rest of it. But to look at what's happened now with the uh, with Chinese investment, let me just go back to the colonial idea. The, the colonies were all divided up uh, by the agreements that were, that were made in, in Berlin and, and thereafter. And each part of each imperialist power created countries which they st stuck together with entirely arbitrary barriers. And then they developed the infrastructure. In other words, a rail system to go back to the empire, another rail system to go and, and roads to, in other words, to extract the riches of Africa. There was no coordination across countries. Even now, it's bizarre that there is so little integration you know, throughout, throughout Africa. The trade inside Africa is only something like 12% of the total trade of Africa is within. In the European Union, for what that's worth, it's something like 70%, 70%. So Africa is disunited, it's fragmented. Now China offers to develop the infrastructure. What does it do? It develops with the national state. And of course, you have corrupt regimes from top to bottom. They're very keen to be able to develop and, and maybe develop mining or something else that the Chinese would, you know, would come in and do it. And they develop the rail system. Maybe it's improved. Yes, it will definitely be improved from what colonialism offered. But it's not going to cross, cut across the countries and develop Africa as a whole, develop the continent. It's not aimed to do that. It's fracturing. It's, it's, it's reinforcing the fracturing of, of Africa. And on top of it, to make it a, a easy, as in Zimbabwe and, and, and elsewhere, and, and in Namibia, and in how many, Zambia, and, and many other countries, there's a, a, they develop, a, they work together with, with a one-party state regime, or the, well, the state apparatus, the ruling party, uh, there's money flowing at that, and then the state will then do the uh, protection for them. They will then organize everything and the contracts and, and, and all of that to be able to, to, to accommodate you know, the Chinese. So there's money flowing. There's a development of, of a certain type, but it's not structured according to the African continent and the integration of Africa and the interpenetration and, and the unification of Africa. It reinforces that fragmentation. And then there's debts. Those debts, as, in, as, as is happening, particularly in Zambia, they found with something like five times what was originally officially reported. Now you've got to pay back these debts. Now these debts cannot be repaid. That's, that's a fact. But the Chinese are going to hold, you know, the Chinese bureaucracy is going to hold Zambia, you know, to, to get to pay them, at least to give, give them 80% of what, what they decide. Eventually it's going to be a disaster for the Chinese. The Chinese bureaucracy, because they, they've, they've, well, it's, it's, it's powerful enough an economy to take such little, little problems, a billion here, dollars, you know, a billion there. But it's, uh, it's, it's counterproductive to developing the national economy, let's put it that way, even on a capitalist basis, but certainly and most, most uh, emphatically, it's counterproductive to workers' rights. I mean, the, the, the behavior of the Chinese bureaucracy in Namibia is unspeakable. And that's the same as uh, happens in, uh, in, in Zimbabwe uh, and elsewhere. Apparently, uh, you know, I'm hearing from what's happening in Zimbabwe, the miners uh, there are just wrecking, uh, the, the Chinese owned mining companies are just wrecking rural communities and they couldn't give a damn. There's no control, there's no environmental control over those, those guys. They do their own thing because they've been given the green light from above. And the issue of socialism with Chinese characteristics, which Xi Jinping is developing in China, you had in SWAPO saying SWAPO is developing socialism with Chinese characteristics. Uh, SWAPO uh, also was involved, the uh, officers and the Minister of Fisheries and Justice in selling off the licenses, being bribed to give licenses to the Icelandic fishing company um, that has led the fishermen uh, destitute and loss of their jobs. Uh, this corruption, it seems to be endemic, and also the judicial system, uh, the corruption of the judicial system. Is this a, a system-wide problem uh, for the people of Africa now? Well, well, it's becoming that. Uh, you, you know, the problem, uh, Steve, is that, you know, in a, in a national liberation struggle, which has characterized much of Africa against colonialism, 
we've established a, you know, there's a vision for a complete transformation. Maybe there was that vision. In many countries, there was. And people want to change everything from top to bottom. But every state has not done away with the detention laws under colonialism. Very little of the actual legislation of, 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 of uh, British colonialism or French colonialism is removed from the state. That's just one, one element. The uh, a ruling elite, well, you have a ruling elite. They are confronting a world system of inequality on which they're a tiny, they're a small bit player and they struggle to do. So sometimes they talk anti-imperialist and all the rest of it, but they'll never go too far because they know where their bread and butter is uh, coming from. They know that in the end, they have to make peace with, with uh, America, with the world system and so forth. So they look on a nationalist basis to holding on to power. Every regime which has come to power, the first priority is to stay in power. They do not look to unifying Africa. Everyone talks pan-Africanism. But actually, in the, in, in the speeches, if you listen to them, particularly when they're not speaking in English or in French, is they mention, suddenly mention this or that, and you ask, what, what is all that about? Oh, you didn't know. I said, oh, well, I'm a sucker. I didn't know. He said, oh, they, that's that group there, which he, he, he doesn't approve of. Those are the Shangans that I, that I didn't want here. Oh, it's, it's the Malawians. Malawians are the people who migrated from Malawi into Zimbabwe. Disgusting. If a white person said it, it would, he'd be, you know, condemned from top to bottom, but it's all in the local language and it's, it's, it's got away with. So, you know, you have this Pan-African in words, but in local language, you know, you're against you know, opposing states or other countries and particularly opposed to all kinds of minorities. So many minorities in Southern, in, in Southern Africa and, and in Africa, you know, struggle. And so you have grievances uh, developing and, and a splitting of countries. We don't need this national, we want the national and social tasks resolved, you know, by a thoroughgoing revolution, which ends in, in, in dealing with all the social problems. Uh, Sankara, the president who's celebrated in Burkina Faso, you know, he came to power. It wasn't, it wasn't the purest of regimes in a way, but look what the man did. I mean, he brought rights to women. He stopped the brutal uh, assault on, on women just by mobilizing the women and mobilizing society and just saying it's not, not going to happen. He brought in vaccination so that the people are actually immune to so many of the diseases of Africa. And that was, I think, in a period of three years. Now we're sit, sitting in stagnation. South Africa has a marvelous scientific base and we cannot produce our own vaccines. We can't even reproduce the vaccines that are out there. Our society is going backwards. It, South Africa had a scientific base which created all kinds of, uh, of, of innovations, you know, in the past, you know, such as, as reverse uh, osmosis and things like, like that, which were patent, patented in South Africa and then exported to, sold to other people. Our society hasn't got the, now the intelligence politically to be able to develop all those treasures of our scientific base. So our society moves, moves backwards and we need a complete change to be able to get to be able to move ahead for all our, our, all our citizens, all classes in the sense, even the middle class should benefit you know, from a thoroughgoing revolution. Mm. And the idea of internationalism that is possible now, one of the positive things during the pandemic is the use of communication technology for workers in Africa to communicate with each other and, and communicate with workers around the world. How do you foresee the development of internationalism linking up workers of uh, South Africa, Namibia, and workers of Africa with Latin America, the United States, and the rest of the world. Well, this is this is a dream, and and it's but it's realizable now, and and, and I think we need to look at it. You know, in, in the anti-apartheid movement, we developed uh, a theme. Uh, this was the left, you know, in the anti-apartheid movement, who were linked to the unions in South Africa. We want direct union to union link, worker to worker link, factory to factory link, so that workers could talk to each other. And the solidarity is not something you struggle for, it will be automatic. It would happen because you hear of the need and you just respond to it. We have now the apparatus to do this, you know, through our various development of social media, through the forums which you can, we can establish. It's very difficult. For instance, in Zimbabwe, we've had uh, comrades there struggling to, uh, to connect and you ask, well, what happened? Did you not have Wi-Fi? 
No, Wi-Fi was okay. We didn't have electricity. <laughs> In other words, we've, you know, we've, we've got the system down you know, for a whole week. Uh, and so forth. We, we're dealing with vulnerable societies, which are not working like, you know, in, in any way as, as, as they had in the past. So there's those, you know, there are those challenges, but the excitement of workers talking to workers, seeing other workers also working in a uranium factory or dockers in uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco, talking to dockers in Durban and exchanging about how they work, even some very ordinary stuff, just to know that you are not alone. You're part of a class which is doing fantastic work. Right now, there's all this anxiety, you know, about moving the containers. Our guys know it. They know how to move the stuff. And we live and learn for each other. We don't like doing a, a, a poor job. We're doing, we work, we're workers and we're proud of what we can do. This is what workers tell me. They know how to move the stuff, but the system's not working. The equipment's not right. There's this or that, and it can be resolved. We don't want society to flounder and, and fall. On the other hand, we're not making profits for anybody where we're not also involved and all of us and our society is going to benefit from it. So we want to talk to each other and at level with each other and learn from each other. And the issue of apartheid, uh, apartheid regime in Israel, uh, there was an effort to have some solidarity. Uh, Israel and South Africa have a large trading relationship. Zim ships go to Durban. Uh, what happened with that? And, and uh, what is preventing the working class of South Africa from uniting with the uh, Palestinians? Well, there's an instinctive response. When uh, South African workers see what's happening to Palestinian people and workers, it's, uh, you, you know, this is back to apartheid, and it is apartheid. It's, a, it's the strict separation of peoples, the building of walls, the firing into uh, groups which are protesting, the deliberate uh, smashing of, of, of people, for instance, the Israelis shooting at the legs, you know, of uh, Palestinian, you know, people who, who, who are not assaulting. Anyway, look, it's unspeakable. You know, it's, 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 it's cunning, it's devious, it's devilish, it's, it's disgusting. So, you know, people see that. Now how to move in solidarity, move beyond the feeling of solidarity to be able to, to exercise it. Well, you know, I've been working with others to be able to block the boats, to stop the, you know, the Zim ships, you know, coming into Durban, uh, and to be able to, you know, put up uh, barriers, you know, to the, to the, de, you know, the deformed way in which they're developing trading relations, uh, not only with South Africa and Israel, but actually they are, um, Durban is an entreport. It's, it's a container a, um, harbor, which you dump containers, and then, when they come from China, they dump containers there. And then the shipping from America comes to Durban. And then they put the uh, Chinese, the, the containers from China onto those ships and the trans-shipping is going on. So, you know, Zim lines are involved in that. Now, I'm not saying that, so it's not necessarily direct trade with, uh, with Israel itself. It's just that that shipping line is a state shipping line and the profits that they are making, which are quite considerable, are feeding back into the state and into a state which is hostile to the interests of the majority of the people in that area. Mm. Well, I wanna thank you very much for joining us. We've been talking with David Hempson, an organizer, educator, writer about the struggle of working class in South Africa and Namibia. And I think we can say that it's closer to the word workers of the world unite with the new world situation that we have. There's a major strike wave developing in the United States and globally of workers who are fed up and are fighting back and trying to organize and struggle for their survival. So I wanna thank you for joining us on Workweek, David. Okay, thanks, Steve.